going to be really happy with. And this particular picture was taken in the Pontanel. My husband and I had gone down the Rio Negro River to look for skimmers because there were, there were nesting skimmers down there. And I hadn't at that point in time ever seen baby skimmers. But when we arrived, the babies uh, were there, but the parents were terribly upset over the fact that we were there. And I said to my husband, this, nothing's worth a, that kind of a picture. So I turned to leave and as I did, I looked back and I saw this caiman on a, on a, a sand peninsula, the reflection in the water, the light was hitting him. He almost looked like he was bronze. And I thought, oh, so I jumped in the boat, got down on uh, my blog at eye level and got four pictures. And I remember thinking if these turn out I will be thrilled. And fortunately they did. And that's because after I got the four pictures, the light changed, it became steely gray and it didn't have the same uh, um, impact at all. So um, I, I was thankful for that. So lighting was important. And just before we get into any further in lighting, lighting comes from three sources. And that was something that uh, was key to me because your lighting comes from the shutter speed, it comes from your f-stop or depth of field, and it comes from your ISO. Now for me personally, I am an action photographer. So I always go out and immediately set my camera with a shutter speed of a minimum of 1250 because I want to capture act, I want to be able to capture that action. And even though you might be photographing something that's just perched or really not moving, you never know when you're going to have that moment and something exciting is going to happen. So I do that. Then I set depth of field and then ISO. Now the cameras today are wonderful. Their ISO capabilities are so much better than when I started. And although I don't go much higher than about 2000 in ISO, I know you can, but the problem with uh, going higher in ISO is that you tend to um, have a problem with, with noise. And so I try to watch for that. And um, I shoot in manual, so um, that's, that's how I start. I go out, set my shutter speed, shut the F, set the F stop, and then shut the, set the uh, ISO. So, the next picture that I want to share with you is um, a bird from, from uh, a hummingbird from Ecuador. Now in this one, the tail is so long and it's a very difficult bird to try to get the whole thing with the lighting on it. So I just stayed with it and as it, 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 it pays off to, to be patient and just follow it along and try and get the light just in the right spot. Now the whistling duck has always been a challenge for me because if you don't have the light directly behind you coming straight in on the subject, especially this one, you won't get the detail in the underwing. So I'm very, very conscious of, of the light for him. And I had, a, it took me a while before I was able to capture him so I could get the light in every you know, part of his body. And the same with the um, Northern Harrier. Uh, they're a beautiful bird, I love them. But often I'd get one wing in light and the other wing would be in a little bit in shadow. So again, the lighting is so important and it's just um, a key thing to make sure that it's always, always behind you and that you're at an angle that you're gonna get the light coming in. Now that's not always easy because you've got a moving subject, but just it's something to, to try to keep in mind so that you can work on that and uh, get the best you can. This was taken in Etosha and it was early in the morning. The light was golden and which is, you have such a small window with that light, but I, but I always try to make the best of that moment that I can. So these were the black faced in Pala had, and they had come down to, to uh, get water. But I was always conscious of their eyes too. I wanted to make sure that I got all four eyes in focus and not have one covered up. Uh, the next is the uh, Gould's uh, Jewel Breasted Hummingbird. This is such a, such a beautiful hummingbird and it's from Ecuador. But again, if your lighting isn't in the right place, you're going to lose a lot of its beauty. So I, I always um, 
just kept that in mind and moved along so that I could get him so the light was hitting him directly. And this uh, is a picture of a glass frog from Costa Rica. Now, they're more difficult because you have to be very careful with the lighting you use. I personally, I know a lot of people do use flash, but I don't. I've seen what it's done to hummingbirds and flash setups and they just seem that it's almost like they're, they, they're just caught. And so I chose not to do that. And the same with the frogs. So we, what we did was use a, a lighting that went underneath the leaf and kind of just came up and, and um, gave him enough light that we were able to see him. But they're a beautiful little frog. You don't see them very often. And I was thrilled when we saw him. Uh, this, yes? Um, one of our people asked, do you ever use the software, your photo processing software to lighten the uh, areas that are darker, shadows? You know, yeah, that's a good question. The only thing, I do very, very little processing. I use Photoshop and in the processing, I will use the levels and curves, but I very rarely use any other kind of um, software. In fact, I, um, I don't, I, the only software I have is, is the, the um, Nick Sharpner that I use sometimes, but not all that often. And uh, it's pretty much, I try to take what I can, if possible, in the camera and then do as little as, but I love editing. Editing is something I really have enjoyed over the years. And it's fun to, to see what you can, can do when you just tweak the levels or just tweak curves. Curves isn't something that you can always use, but sometimes it just makes it pop. And uh, that's really about all I do in editing. So this was taken late at night. Uh, again, it was golden lighting and the giraffes had come in for the last little bit of um, the last visit to the water hole for the evening. And then we were able to get, fortunately the water was still, so we were able to get a reflection. Mm. Now exposure. Um, that's always been a tricky thing, the exposure. And what I've done is just when I go out, I ex expose my, do my exposure on the sky to get an idea of what the lighting is for that day. And then I can work on the subject that I'm um, shooting um, after that. Judy, do you have a particular f-stop that you like to use? Well, you know, I do. I, I pretty much... <laughs> I pretty much always have my shutter speed somewhere between 1250 and 2000 and then my f-stop varies from 7.1 to maybe f10 but not I don't go too much higher but I'm always watching for exposure the big thing for me is it in get trying to get the exposure right is to watch that bar in your camera at the bottom either you're you're overexposed or underexposed now i tend to do one one third or two thirds stops under because you can you can tweak it to bring it up but it's difficult to bring it down if you're overexposed you've lost you know some detail and it's 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 difficult but now you'll get varying opinions of that. Some people shoot right on the zero so that you don't have that problem. You know, I don't, they're happy with that. But I found that it's worked better for me just to be a third, maybe a third under. What camera do you shoot with? Pardon? What camera do you shoot with? I shoot the Nikon 850. Uh-huh. Okay. And the Nikon, the new one, the 500. Um, and it's been a nice combination. Um, it's worked well and it's easy to carry. I used to have the big 600 and 500, but you know, they get harder and you, the flexibility is, is, is less. And I find I can easily handhold. I do a lot of hand, a lot of my pictures are handheld, but I, but I totally agree with a tripod. If that's possible and you can use a tripod, I think your, your um, end result is going to be good. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one. Now, this one was taken up at uh, Hooganton up in, in the Jacksonville area. These are uh, difficult shots for the sense that um, they're at the beach. So you get that reflective light off the sand. And so 
the only way I found that I could counteract that, and that, of course, shooting in the early morning light, you don't want to get out there when the light's too strong, but to ex expose on the subject directly on the chick, and then you get the whites so they're not blown out. But that's a wonderful place. I don't know if any of you have been to Hoogaton, but it's great. It's, uh, it's in July and the, the Royal Turns, there's just hundreds and hundreds of Royal Turns there. And it's a beautiful spot. I love those little babies. Now this, um, this is a toughie to expose because this is the, um, got a metal block now, from, from uh, uh, Costa Rica. Wasn't that awful? I can't think of the name of it. Judy, let me move over to something else while you're thinking. Yeah. Um, the place that you did the turns, was that Huguenot Beach? Yes, Huguenot okay. Beach. Because mm -hmm. oh. I, yes, I have been there. It's an it's a amazing experience. It's, it's almost overwhelming, but if you go in and just kind of look around and, and observe what's happening, you can kind of, you know, figure out how to zoom in on certain areas. Mm -hmm. oh. I That's a cock of the rock bird. Yes. Yes. Oh, I don't know why I had a middle block. This was a bird that was a, one that for years we wanted to photograph, but they're deep in the canopy usually, and the lighting is so poor that, you know, it was almost impossible. But we were able um, this last couple of trips to get them. And the thing in, with the new cameras, you, you can up that ISO, and that has made a tremendous difference in a heavy canopy. A lot of people are afraid of Costa Rica because of the canopy and the lighting, but really um, you can do it now. And they're a wonderful little bird. And the next one is the cock of the rock that's found in Ecuador. And it's down towards the Amazon basin. They're a different color altogether, but mm -hmm. also deep in the canopy. So it was a, it was a challenge to capture him. And this is the uh, Southern Bill, Hornbill, that's from Atosha. Being that it's black and white, that's always a tricky exposure to try and get. And um, I tend to, as I mentioned earlier, a third or, or two thirds under, and then I'm able to bring it up and then I don't overexpose the whites. So that's how he was captured. Now here, this is one from, um, uh, uh, you can know. Jackson, <coughs> Jacksonville, and that's the Royal Churn. Now, in this composition, the diagonal is a desired um, type of composition. And of course, you try and get as much as you can with, if you can, with the fan tail and your exposure so that you can get the detail under all the wings. And they're, they're just, it's a wonderful place to practice flight shots and just working on exposures and and action. Now this was a, a fawn-breasted brilliant. This was from uh, Costa Rica. He was he was feeding, but I I'm sorry, he wasn't. This one wasn't feeding. He was he was perched, and I knew at some point in time he was going to 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 fly away. And I I I just prepared myself. Sometimes waiting is a very key thing in photography because you can't just go out and grab that picture. You have to, really, you have to anticipate. And a lot of my photography is knowing the, the subject, knowing what they'll do, and then waiting for it to happen. So I, my camera was on this little guy. And when he finally took off, I was able to capture him. And, uh, this one is from the Pantanal, and this is the Scarlet Macaw. And if, if it's at all possible to capture the top side, that's a desirable um, uh, flight image pose to get, but of course not always possible, but you just, you practice. I think practice in photography is key. You just, even though there may not be a lot happening, maybe it's, it's, it's um, um, Ibis coming in. That was where I first started at Wakota Hatchie with Ibis. I just keep shooting them and shooting them. My husband said, why do you keep shooting these same birds over and over? And I said, well, practice makes perfect, right? So you just keep trying. And uh, so that was, and the eagle again, this was another one of the eagle with the top side and the fan, fan tail. I love them. They're such a beautiful bird and I can see why they were used over 
over time as, as symbols of strength and they're just a, a wonderful species. This little one was, uh, it's a, a violet, uh, brown violet ear hummingbird from Costa Rica. Now, often when they come into a feeder or into a flower, they'll hover. And if you keep your eyes on them, you can, you can just watch them, you, they'll pull out. And when they pull out, if you're ready and you've got your settings right, the high shutter speed and your exposure, then you can just kind of grab that shot. Now this was um, the turns. This was here in Florida and I had gone over to see the baby turns and there were just hundreds of turns on the beach. But I was watching and I noticed that they fly up in the air in altercations. So I just kind of kept my eyes open for that. I had my exposure pretty much set on what I wanted it to be. And so when it happened, I was prepared and ready to grab that shot. These are, I'm sorry, Judy. Uh -huh. These skimmers, where, what beach did you see them on? This was at St. Pete's. I'm just trying to think. Oh, it was, okay. There used to be a, 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 um, a center where they, a rehab center. I don't think it's there anymore. I think maybe part of that area was ruined with the storms, but there were just a lot of, at one time of skimmers in that area. Mm. But they're all along the west coast. Uh huh. They're beautiful. They are. Now this is the plate um, build mountain uh, toucan. You don't see them very often, and they're high, high up in a canopy. And we w went up specifically to capture this bird. Uh, I had never seen it before on our last trip to um, Ecuador. And he, he'd been feeding on these little berries that you see around. And so, again, I, I was focused on him while he was feeding and I knew eventually he was going to fly away. And that's when this uh, picture was captured. We also got some pictures of a nest. They were nesting. And it was quite interesting to see them because they fly in and fly out. And you just wonder how they ever could fly into these holes. With this, they're a fairly large bird but nature's amazing. Now this is um, the saber wing butterfly. This is an example of not having everything sharp as far as drop dead, catching it in, in, in your shutter speed. But I always liked it because it gave the feeling of motion and movement, but the, the, the most important part was the eye and the head head was sharp and in, in focus. So this has been a, a picture that I've always enjoyed. So there are times where, you, you know, some people work at that to get them, have the shutter speed just at a, a setting where it will give you that little bit of blur in the wing. Judy, is there any way on some of these images you could give us, if you could remember what the technique might have been? Um, well, on this one, I remember I was, I was photographing the saber wing and I had gotten a few pictures, but I, I was hoping to get him in, fright, in flight and I didn't really have as high a shutter speed as I often would for hummingbirds. I usually am around 2000 for a hummingbird, mm -hmm. but this was down at 1250 so that when he did fly, I was able to, to capture that, that blur. And your depth of field? Uh, depth of field would have been, I, I don't usually go much lower than, than 7.1. I don't know exactly, but it would be 7.1 or 8. And ISO, any idea? Uh, the ISO is usually fairly high in Costa Rica because of, of the canopy. Mm -hmm. uh, I would guess it was probably somewhere between 1,600 and 2,000. Thank you. Now, this section, um, there's 10 things I'm covering, and this one's on behavior, and I, I think it, it can really create an interesting image if we're really conscious of the behavior. And when we were up in Alaska, I'd been watching this mother sow with her babies, and she was teaching them the clam, and we just followed her. And then, you know, like all little babies, they like to play with mom, and it was fun to capture this picture. And I think uh, if we can capture those moments, it really um, makes for uh, an interesting image for, for
for people to see that, that aren't photographers that maybe don't get the opportunity to go to some of these places. And uh, I just, you know, it was amazing to me this trip because we were so close to the bears and I never dreamed in, in, in my life that I would be that close to a grizzly. But, you know, animals are, are very loving and they're just like, like everything else, unless they feel threatened, they didn't bother us at all. We were told to keep within, 50, I think it was 50 yards, but we did have one little little uh, bear come close to us and it was, it was so close that I froze. I was just a, like a pillar of salt. I just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't even take a picture because it was too close. And I thought, oh my goodness, I hope the mother doesn't notice her cub has wandered over. Well, the, the guy that was with us, this was at Katmai, he just got up and made a tiny little noise and the little baby just, cub just moved off. But it was an exciting moment. Uh, now this was in the Pantanal. This is the red and green macaws. It's in a what they call a cenote. It's a big sinkhole and at the bottom there's water and then it's, it, I, I don't know how I can describe the size. It's a fairly large hole. But the macaws, for some reason, love this area and they fly around and they land on the cliffs. But there's always usually an altercation because there's usually two or three of them that want the same spot to land on because there aren't many. So I, again, was anticipating what could happen and just watching. And that's when um, I captured this one. They kind of got after each other. Hmm. Beautiful bird. Now, the, this is a picture of the violet ear hummingbird. I had, it was one of our first trips to Costa Rica and I had, there were calla lilies in the garden and I had seen this hummingbird come and land in the calla lily and I thought, oh my gosh, if I could capture that. Well, I watched him and he'd fly away and he'd feed and then he'd come back to the calla lily. So I set up my tripod and my uh, 600 lens and I just waited and sure enough, he did come back. So these aren't, aren't images that are just captured, they're, they're anticipated. And uh, I think that's a, a real key to getting some different, new, unique pictures. Now this was taken at High Island down in um, Texas. And it was interesting, High Island ha has three, basically three species. There are others that will come in, but it's mainly the cormorants, the white egrets, and the spoonbills. And there is definitely a pecking order. The cormorants have the penthouse and the white egrets have the middle ground and the poor spoonbills, they have the, the basement. And so this white egret had come in and I, I would see this altercation happening when one would try to take someone else's territory and kind of waited for that to happen and captured this one. Now this is, of course, um, the Pantanal, the jaguar, and they're just, they're just an incredibly beautiful animal. And uh, I captured him, he was resting and we just sort of watched him for a while. And then he woke up and gave us a big yawn. <laughs> I sort of knew how he felt at that moment. <laughs> mm. Oops, oh, sorry, I went too fast. Now I had not, this is at Merritt Island and I've seen altercations with the tricolor herons, with um, cattle egrets, but I had never seen any altercation with the spoonbills. Not, not in the air, not air altercation. And because my shutter speed was high, as I mentioned earlier, I always keep it there. So if something does happen, because this happened very quickly, I wasn't, I mean, I was just taking pictures of spoonbills as they were, it was kind of like a feeding frenzy. And then they all of a sudden went up in the air. And because that shutter speed was set high, I was able to capture this, this image. And I was shocked because it was certainly different. I always thought, I never thought of the spoonbills as quite so aggressive, but I learned. And now this one was taken at High Island. I'm not sure if this was a courting picture or if it was an altercation, but um, it was fun to, to see the action between these two. And uh, they, they certainly stayed there for a little while, giving us opportunities to get a few pictures before they eventually flew off. Now this composition 
I, uh, lighting, composition. Composition is such a, an important thing in, in photography. If you've got a good composition, you're going to have an image that you're going to be happy with in the end. And so often it's easy to get caught up with what you're seeing and you forget about the background or you forget about what's going on around. But all of that plays into a good picture. And this particular day with this um, brown hooded parrot, it started to rain quite heavily. And the people that were there, they all headed in. And I said, oh, you should stay. You really should stay because there's some great activity that goes on in the rain. I had, I had learned that with the, the burring owls. I had photographed them in the rain and they get so playful and they turn upside down and they do all kinds of things. So that's how this one was captured. And I think I was the only one there. People didn't. Now this one, the reason um, I have this one in here was just the lines in this composition. It was the lines of the plant and the lines of the frog. And this is your um, picture of the red-eyed frog from Costa Rica. And this one, um, the uh, southern hornbill, uh, yellow hornbill from Etosha, from Namibia, they always land, it seems, in, in these thorn, the acacia trees. And I could never really quite understand how they do that, how they miss those thorns. But they do. And I, I kept this composition with a lot of the tree in because I wanted people to see where they land and, and you know, what life is like over there. Now, this one is the um, parrot snake. And I loved his coloring. He was beautiful. He's not a venomous snake, but he's from Costa Rica. And the key thing for this uh, image for me was the eye, the golden eye. So I positioned myself down on the ground. I actually was, was almost lying on the ground so that I could get, um, you know, at eye level with him to capture the, the main focus for me, which was the eye. And this one, <laughs> there have been two red-eyed frogs on a, on a limb. And for some reason, I guess the one shows that he wanted to get to the other side. <laughs> so I just waited for that and it was fun to capture the two together. I don't, I, I'm not sure if they were male or female or just two frogs, but it was just a fun picture. Now this was the, um, uh, he built Toucan. So often you, you see them perched and they're beautiful perched, just, just sitting perched but I wanted to capture something with a little bit of a different twist. So I just stayed and waited. And I don't remember now how long it was, but it was a while before he finally decided that he was going to move. And uh, I think our aim is to always capture something that's not strictly a documentary picture, but something that captures a little bit of the, 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 the character of the, of the bird and the personality. Now this is a um, barbet toucan. They're a pretty little bird. I, I only saw them for the first time on the last trip to Ecuador. And he was, was feeding on the berries. So he gave us some wonderful opportunities to get images of him. And uh, I included the berries rather than just him because I wanted people to, un to understand what it was like and what kind of an uh, uh, environment they lived in. Now, this was my nemesis. I love the metal lark, but he's always on a post or he's always on a wire. And so we went to Payne's Prairie this one day and we spent the day just specifically trying to catch this little guy on something other than a post. And uh, so we were able to capture him on, on the grasses. Now this is from, from Jacksonville area too, and this was the Royal Turns. Now I do have the whole picture. I have the, the whole mother turn and the baby, but what was interesting to me was the passing of the fish. So I cropped it, and I don't think we should ever be afraid of cropping to point out the story that we're trying to convey to the, to the viewer. And uh, I was excited because it, the, the little babies, they wait and they wait and they wait and then the mother comes in and she's got a fish and they grab it. And if you can capture those moments, it's, it's really, really fun. 
And this one was from Costa Rica. This is a little hummingbird. It's a volcano. They're one of the tiny, tiny little hummingbirds. Beautiful little bird, but he landed on this plant with all the curves and leaves. And it just, uh, it, it just for me, visually had a nice um, look and I, I um, was able to capture a few, few images of him before he left. That was the female and they have this beautiful little purple feathers under their, their beak, sweet bird. Now this one was um, taken again up in Jacksonville and it's, it's trying to capture a little bit of the environment that these birds come in and to try to capture human flight with as much um, wing position and feather detail in the, in the, in the uh, tail as possible. And I watched for that. I saw that area and I knew they were coming in and out, in and out. And so finally I had the, the opportunity to capture this image. But again, that was pre, predestined. I mean, I, I, I survey the, the whole beach area and look and see, well, you know, where's there a beautiful background and where is action happening and so forth. Now this one is a black cap tanager. This is from uh, Ecuador. There's, um, it's fun if you, if you can get a natural framing, uh, just, just frame naturally. And that's what happened with this one. The, the, the moss was growing down and he was uh, perched there. And so I, I captured that one. There's such a pretty little bird, but I, I love that. You don't always have that opportunity to get natural framing, but if you do, it's a fun, fun uh, opportunity. Now, this one was really more for the turn back pose. I, I like those poses when they turn back. And uh, so I put that one in just to show the difference in the two. Now, this is probably one of my favorite hummingbirds. This is from Southern, well, the Southeastern part of Ecuador. It's down near the Amazon basin. They're the second smallest hummingbird in the world. And this is the wire crested uh, thorntail. He is so small. He can hardly, I mean, to try to follow him. And he's so fast. He's like a bee almost. And with the canopy, it was very difficult to separate him. So I saw there was a door from one of the buildings that was back to the left of the, the canopy. So I moved my tripod and camera and set myself up so that when he came to land on this stick, I had the door as the background so that was able to set him off because otherwise you wouldn't get a chance to see his beauty in the same light if you've got so much behind. But he, that's the male. The female doesn't have that long, long tail, but she does, and she doesn't have quite the, the top notch that he has, but she's very beautiful also. Now this eye level in photography is another thing that I found was important. And I often would be down on my, my stomach trying to get to capture the um, burrowing owls. And this little guy was fun because he thought he was so sharp picking up this feather. <laughs> uh, he gave me a moment to capture a picture of him now these are two little outlets and they started to go out into the fields. And this was at uh, Vista Park in Southern Florida. And they were playing and I got down on my stomach and I was watching them and <laughs> the one grabbed the other one's leg or tail or whatever it is, I'm not sure. Say, hey, wait for me. So that was a fun moment. It, these, all these actions and, and things that are happening uh, are such great uh, moments and such wonderful memories. Now this is um, eye level for the for the barred owl. It's not always an easy situation because you invariably find them high in a tree. And I remember there was a fellow that was with me one day, and he was he was photographing, it and I said, you know, if you move back keep moving back and moving back as far back as you can and still get a decent picture, you'll decrease that angle of, of, of photographing so it doesn't look, because it's not really an ideal shot to be, to be shooting up. You don't really want that. And uh, so we were able to capture this little guy. 
we have such beautiful species in Florida. I mean, you can travel the world, but there's all, an awful lot here. It's wonderful. Now this is on backlighting. Backlighting doesn't always work, but it can. And I haven't done too much in backlighting. I have on, a, on, on some birds. This was taken in Etosha. It was early morning, there'd been a kill and the hyenas came in and I saw the light just hitting the high hairs along the hyenas back. And I thought, oh, that would be a nice, nice image. And so don't ever uh, count out backlighting because it can be, be very, um, very good. Be happy with it. Now circumstances, this, um, this was taken at Green K, and I think all of you probably know that area. And there's a part at the very back of Green K early on when it was first, when it had first been built. And the lighting is beautiful back there. And there was a lot of water. And I walked back because I knew that's where I was gonna have the best light. And I thought anywhere else I go, I'm not gonna really be happy with my pictures. And I went to the back, the water was like glass, the lighting was golden. And I thought, oh, if something just flies in, this will be heavenly. And I waited, there was nothing there, but I waited. And of course the tricolor herons are wonderful when they, when they are fishing. And I captured this image and it's probably been my most lucrative uh, picture because this one won um, in National Wildlife, the, um, what was it first place? It was it was it was the one above that, and I can't think of the name now. Anyway, it did well, and it, it's a simple picture. Sometimes the, the the birds that we see every day, we think, oh well, I've seen that, I've seen that, I've seen that, but they can turn out to be some of the prettiest images of all. So we never want to count anything out. Grand prize. That's what I was trying to think of for that one. The grand prize. Uh, now this one. Uh, it's really important that we choose the right camera and the right lens for what we're shooting. If, if, if we're in Africa, uh, it's really important to have a telephoto lens because the zebras will go into such action. But if you have a stationary lens, a straight 600 or a straight 500, and the zebras start to move in, you've lost that um, opportunity to capture the, the action. So, um, I've always um, taken a zoom lens and invariably that's what I use, even though I, I'm happy with my prime lenses, I really like those. Um, so, and then pictures tell a story. I think that's a key thing. We want to tell a story with our pictures. We want people to be drawn in and want to see them. And this is the lilac breasted roller. Now we had gone down some of the roads. Oh, my throat's a little bit dry, excuse me down some of the roads in Etosha and we knew where the lilac breasted rollers would, would, would likely be. And they hunt for little insects and things and they, they perch and then they fly down and then they perch and they fly down. And so we just waited. And sure enough, the lilac ro breasted roller went down, got one of these little insects. And be sometimes before they actually take it in, they'll throw it up in the air. And that's when this one was, was captured. But again, I can't stress enough anticipation in photography. I think that's key. Um, I don't know why I had that one in. Oh, this was taken at Green K. And I've been watching this little juvenile um, um, black neck still. And I could just imagine what he was thinking. He saw this little feather on the water and he thought, oh my goodness. So he went after it and he caught it. <laughs> and then it got away. <laughs> Yeah, oh, whoops, I missed one. Well, then, then it got away. So it was just a fun moment. I, I you know, they, there's so much like little babies of anything in, in wildlife are just like children almost. They, they like to play, they like to have fun. And, and then this one, this one was taken at Wakota Hatchie. And I, again, you all probably know this area well. I was there the day that the Woodstorks took over that, um, that island and it was ruthless. Every nest was just thrown into the water. Anyway, they did take over the island. And when, when I went out to, to photograph, I thought, oh, there's just a mass of Woodstorks. Where do you go from here? 
but my eye caught this, this, this pear. And, you know, nature is really has so much emotion and it was so loving that moment. So I, I zoomed in on that. Now I couldn't take the whole bird because there were so many other things around, but I captured just the head part that showed the, 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 the just the love and, 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 and uh, uh, between them. And um, it was just a great moment for me. But again, just, just it's, it's like with the old camera where they put a little hole in the paper and you zoom in on just, if you took, look at the whole picture, sometimes it's just too much, it's overwhelming. But just take time and look closely and you might just find a, a little, little gem there somewhere. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thank okay. you for sharing all of those great pictures and stories with us. Um, well, it's been my honor and pleasure, really, Nancy. Thank you for having me. And I wish you all wonderful, wonderful days of photography and moments in 221. I have a lot of people here saying wonderful things and how they enjoyed the presentation. Um, let's see. Uh, fabulous, thank you so much. Somebody asked if you prefer portrait or landscape. And no, I I would prefer landscape, landscape and wildlife. I I like portrait if it's children. I'd like to have a long lens and capture them playing where they don't know. But as far as setups and formal kind of photography, that's probably not something I would lean to. So, and I think they were asking the format that you use when you are oh. shooting your pictures. Oh, when I'm shooting, yeah. yeah. Most of the time, it is in landscape, but there are moments. It depends on depends on what your subject is. Now, if you have an elongated subject, then it lends itself very well to a vertical. If mm -hmm. if I've got something that I want to show with the subject I'm taking, then a horizontal maybe will work well. You know, if, if it's the environment that's surrounding it, that if it tells, really what you want in a picture is something that's going to add to it. If you've got empty space or empty, you don't really want that in your picture. You want everything to be as, as um, important as, as possible. And so you, um, I don't, you know, you, the, the, I'm sure you all know the rule of thirds if you're photographing a bird, you want to leave space for it to fly out, but you don't want to leave too much space. Just that, just enough that you that it, there's a balance. It's it's a hard thing to explain, but there's just a balance in composition and uh, empty space. If it doesn't give you any information or doesn't add to your story, then you don't want to to leave that in there. I was just thinking of the calla lily with the little hummer in it but you had it to the left and there was a nice amount of space to the right, but not too much. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's, a, that, you know, that picture was really for a story. Although that picture is, has been published. I mean, it's, it, it's, there's pictures that probably have more in them than that, but that, that was so unusual for that hummingbird to be in a calla lily that I was mm -hmm. thrilled that he came back, <laughs> that he behaved. <laughs> Yeah, that was wonderful. Uh, let's see. So I have great presentation. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will now concentrate more to anticipate the action. I really enjoyed your photos. Thanks for sharing great photos. Um, somebody applauded uh, oh. silently. <laughs> so lots and lots. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, Judy, you want to stop sharing your screen? What was that? Oh, you want to stop sharing your screen? Okay. Yeah, I can do that. If I, oh. Does anybody else have any questions that she'd like? They'd like to ask. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I can't get the mouse to show up. Oh. Can you? Can you stop it, Jay? My well, mouse is not showing up. Well, you know, for me, the most important thing is to see people really enjoy their photography and not to give up. Don't ever give up. It, it takes time.
time. It takes practice and it'll come. It will come. And don't, don't compare. Everybody's different. Everybody's got a different story to tell. And uh, oh, I'm gone. <laughs> well, oh, not you're really. Still you're up in the top middle. Yeah, I. So you're still there. Did you want to you. show any? Oh, oh. Right. There, I've got the, yeah. Okay, so now you want this out. Did you want to share something else from your screen, Judy? Uh, whoops, I'm sorry. How did I do that? Uh, anything else from my screen? Um, well, I, I've got a lot on my desktop, but I can't think of anything offhand, Nancy. I just really want to encourage people to, 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 to experiment, to do it, to, I had a friend, and this is, weighs very heavily on me. He, he was a, a wonderful man. He got all the great equipment, and he was so excited, and I was there the day he got his 500. And then a little a few months later, he said, I'm going to sell it. And I said, why? And he said, well, everybody's so much better than I am. I said, no, 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 no. We all start somewhere. We all start somewhere. Don't do that. Well, he did. And I, th that, that has always bothered me. I just I want people to, to be encouraged and that you don't get it the first time, you'll get it the next time or the next. Um, while we still off. have you, while we still have you, would you mind sharing a little bit about the, um, the trips that you and your husband sponsor? Sure. Yeah. Um, we go to Etosha in Namibia. And that came about, I don't know if any of you ever knew Michael Rosenbaum, but he was a very good photographer. And he kept after Gary and I, he said, you've got to come to Etosha with me. You've got to come. So finally we said, okay, and we spent a month there. We spent a month in Etosha. We learned all the roads and everything there was to see. And it was a fabulous time. And that was really kind of, this was many years ago now. That was the beginning of our trips because I thought, I don't want people to see what we're seeing. And so my husband's really good at putting things together to organizing it and making up. He has everything detailed. He makes lists of what everybody needs to bring right down to toothpaste. I don't know, everything. And so it worked well. And uh, we did that trip. And then the Pontanelle was a place that I loved. Gary and I had gone there together. We loved it. And so we decided to go go back we went back a second time and then started trips there costa rica we go to costa rica which we've done oh i don't know how many trips there maybe 15 we usually do twice a year when when covid's not um, um rampant and then ecuador ecuador was a little bit later but it's it's just an awesome country to visit the species of birds there i, I couldn't even begin to name them all they're wonderful and um where else does it we go? Costa Rica, Ecuador. When you go to Ecuador, do you have a local guide? Yes. Um, yes, you really need to always have a local guide in those places. Well, at Etosha, we don't. Gary and I are the guides, but we know it pretty well now. We, The fellow that um, showed us, he'd been the official um, photographer for Etosha, and he knew it well, so he kind of... Um, uh, helped Michael and Gary and I know what to look for and what to anticipate and so forth. But the other places, Costa Rica, we have a local guide. We go down to the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica, and that's a, a very lovely place to go and visit too. It's it's very different from the rest of Costa Rica. There's uh, there's just so many pictures that you can get in Costa Rica and Ecuador. I couldn't even begin to share them all. You know, like the Quetzal. I remember that. Remember seeing the Quetzal which is such a beautiful bird. I don't know if you know that bird, do you? I, I'm familiar, yeah, I've seen yeah. a lot of pictures of it. I saw it in Panama, we were flying to Argentina uh, when we were living in Argentina and I saw the women weaving this picture, this weaving of a, a Quetzal and I thought, oh, someday, someday I want to see it. I wasn't a photographer then, I was only what, 26 years old, I guess, when I saw it. And so that was a dream come true to see that bird. And it is just, it's, it's magnificent. And we usually do get to see it when we go. There have been one or two trips where we were, you know, fortunate enough to see it, but most of the time we do. We have very, very good guides. And the guide we have in Costa Rica is also a photographer. And that makes such a big difference. 
because they understand. They understand what you're looking for and what you want and the lighting. So. That's great. And if anybody's interested in any of that, she does have a website where she lists um, all of the tours that she gives, though obviously COVID-19, we're not doing very much traveling right now, but. Uh, we're planning now, Nancy, for uh, to, you know 2022. And Gary's working on the Namibia trip right now. And we do have a Costa Rica trip for July of this year, but we will not do it if, if there's any danger to anybody coming. Like if people, you don't want to be in hospital in a strange country. And so we, we're, we just wouldn't do that. We want to make sure everybody's well taken care of and looked after. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So it was a wonderful evening. I hope everybody else I did seem to enjoy it greatly. Jay, do you have any closing con comments you want to close no, up? It was, just, you know, it was fascinating. Love the way you arranged the presentation. And uh, I'll thank everyone for attending. Yep. So if there's no further questions, then uh, I think we've, we've done our evening tonight. And uh, Judy, I'll probably be in touch again. And yeah, say thank you again. Thank you all. Enjoyed it. It's a pleasure. Good, Good evening, Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome.